Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. This time we're going back to the year 1972 to a sci-fi novel written by Isaac Asimov called The Gods Themselves. It won a Nebula Award for Best Novel in 1972 and the Hugo Award for Best Novel in 1973. Now this novel is unique in that when the book begins, it begins with chapter 6 and then it goes to chapter 1 then back to chapter 6, then 2, then back to 6, 3 to 6, 4 to 6, 5 to 6. Then it concludes in 6 and the rest of the story continues from 7 on. Now Isaac Asimov has been reported to have said that this was his favorite sci-fi novel that he wrote. Now if you like this content, you can subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you'll know when I've uploaded a video. And now let's get into it. The first part is called Against Stupidity and it begins with doctors Peter Lamont and Myron Bonowski who are discussing a third, Dr. Frederick Hallam. Lamont just had an interview with Hallam and it didn't go well. Dr. Hallam is considered the father of the electronic pump, a title that Lamont is pretty sure he doesn't deserve and he has Bonowski there to decipher an alien intelligence. At this point, we jump into the first flashback, which takes us back to 2070, 30 years ago, when Hallam discovered something that led him to the electronic pump. You see, Hallam used to keep a bottle of Tungsten 186 on his desk. Now, the battle was there since before he got the office. He just never bothered to move it. Well, one day he came into his office and noticed that the contents of the battle was different. So he immediately accosted Benjamin Allen Dennison, who sits in the office across from him, if he knows anything about it. And Dennison replies, how would he know that the contents were different? Which upset Hallam, who then set out to prove that the contents of the bottle was different. And he was right. What was in the bottle was plutonium-186, not tungsten. And plutonium-186 cannot exist in this universe. We jump back to 2100, where Lamont is still talking to Bronowski, and he is convinced that Hallam is taking credit that he doesn't deserve. And then we jump back in time to 2092, when Lamont has just joined Pump Station 1. In the intervening years from 2070, it seems that Hallam had managed to not only discover that plutonium-186 came from another universe, but that the beings in that other universe were transferring the plutonium-186 to ours and taking the tungsten-186 to theirs, and that the plutonium-186 was given off radiation and they were able to use that as free energy, which of course transformed the world. And we must assume that the tungsten being sent to the other universe is also giving off energy in that universe that is transforming their world. This, of course, made Hallam the greatest scientist of his generation. So when a 25-year-old Lamont got there, he decided he's going to do a history on the electronic pump. And his investigations seemed to point to the fact that none of those ideas was Hallam's, that he just took credit for it. Even the design for the electronic pump was from the beans in the other universe. When he brought that up to Hallam, that began the dislike between the two of them. We jump back to 2100, where we learn that Lamont was the one that brought Bronowski in. We jump back in time to 2092, just after the interview that Lamont had with Hallam, and he went to see Bronowski. Bronowski was a world-famous ancient language interpreter, and he was giving a speech at the college, and the college had invited him to come and work for them. Lamont wants Bronowski's help in interpreting the alien language because he's convinced that the aliens are much smarter than humans, and 
If he could interpret their language, he would be able to prove it and stick it to Hallam. Over the next year, very little progress was made on interpreting the Anya language. But in that time, Laman's life became difficult because Harlem was doing everything he could, it seems, to stymie Lamont and his progress. Promotions that should be his were going to others and he was being sidelined. So Lamont began investigating the electronic pump and its workings. The electronic pump transferred energy from one universe to the other and Lamont found out that it may be dangerous. So he went to see Harlem. He wanted Harlem to get so angry that he would kick him out, that at a later time he would be able to say he went to Harlem and Harlem didn't listen to him. And that's exactly what happened. We jump back to the present in the conclusion of chapter 6 and we have Lamont and Brunowski speaking. Lamont intends to go to Senator Byrd who is the head of the committee on technology and the environment. He intends to bring his concerns to him. Meanwhile, Bonansky got a message from the other universe, which was one word, F-E-E-R, fair. He thinks it is fair, F-E-A-R, misspelled, but he doesn't know what it means. So Lamont takes his concerns to the senator, and the senator basically tells him that he will do something if Lamont can prove that he's right. But Lamont can't prove he's right because all the equipment he needs to use is being tied up, and he is not giving access to that equipment by Hallam. The next person Lamont went to see was Judge Roshen, who was one of the people that was responsible for the electronic pump taking over the Earth's energy needs so quickly. But of course, he struck out with him too. When he next met with Bernowski, Bernowski told him that he sent two words over to the other universe, pump bad. And he received an answer that said, yes, pump bad, bad, bad. Lamont now believes that the only chance is to get the people in the other universe to turn off their pump since no one in this one is believing him. It took two weeks, but Bernowski finally got an answer from the other universe. It seems that they were unable to stop the pump and they were desperate and they wanted Earth to stop the pump on this side. Bronowski finally gave up. He said, no one is going to believe us, so we might as well just give up and wait for the end. And he left. And Lamont said that no one on Earth will live to see that he was right. Part 2 is called The Gods Themselves and it takes place in the parallel universe. Now in this parallel universe, the stars are smaller and they have a shorter lifespan than in our universe. That parallel universe also has a much shorter lifespan than our universe. And that universe is dying. Unlike our universe, where when a star dies, it explodes. In their universe, when the stars die, they simply get colder and colder until they go out. So the people in this universe are living in a universe that's dying and their sun is also dying. Now there are two types of intelligent creatures in this universe. They are what is called the soft ones, which are soft ones, which are basically energy beings with varying densities depending on the sex of the creature and hard ones which are physical beings. Now the soft ones have three sexes. They are the rationals or the lefts and they are logical thinkers and they are male and they produce the sperm or the seed and they have a difficult time passing through solid objects, although they are energy beings. The second group are emotionals or mids, and they are identified as female, and they produce the energy that is needed to create babies, and they can pass through solid objects at will. The third sex is the parentals or the rights, and they are the ones that bear the children and raise them. And they are identified 
as male and they can't melt or blend without help. They also have a difficult time concentrating anything except having kids and raising them. They don't care about anything else. So when the soft ones have sex, they flow into each other. Since they're energy beings, they basically become one being for the time that they are having sex. So all soft one marriages have three genders, a rational, an emotional, and a parental. Now the hard ones have one gender, and they seem to be totally rational and scientific and physical. The triad that we are following in part two is Dua, the emotional, or Dean, the rational, and Twit, who is the parental. Now, they already have two kids, a rational and a parental. But unbeknown to our partners, Dua has no intention of ever having a third kid because of something that happened when she was, when she was younger. The parental, the parent she was closest to, passed on and she never got over that so she now that she's an adult has no intention of ever having a third kid because normally after they have the third kid all three parents pass on now Dua was also very strange for an emotional apparently she's an emotional that thinks like a rational so when she was growing up all the other emotionals called her left m left for rational and m for emotional now it takes a lot of energy to create a child that's an emotional and so emotionals tend to go up to the surface of the planet and eat. They eat by absorbing sunlight and that is something that Dua is refusing to do. She's eating as little as possible so that she will never have the energy to help create an emotional. So Odin goes and speaks to his teacher, a hard one, to get advice on what he must do and the hard one told him that since Dua is afraid of passing on, he must find something she likes. And since she likes to learn, he should teach her and put her mind at ease. Now, Twit was tired of waiting. He wanted his third child, an emotional. He didn't understand Dua and why she wasn't like other emotionals, and he didn't care. He didn't understand Odin and why he didn't pressure Dua to eat more so they could have a third child and he didn't care so he went down into the caverns and looked for a hard one and he knew just the hard one that he was going to talk to his name was Eswat and Odin had never met him because he was a new hard one of course he didn't find Oswat and the hard one he did find told him to go back and speak to Odin. On his way back, he tasted food, which he shouldn't have because he's down in the caverns with no access to the sun. He also passed very close to Dua and didn't realize it because the minute she sensed him, she went completely into the rock, something she should not have been able to do. But because of her lack of feeding, she thinned out so much that she was able to do it. And Dua realized that being in a rock increased her sensitivity so that she could sense the hard ones and what they were doing, even though they were a complex away from her. So Dua came back home and began to question Odin. And Odin, remembering what his teacher, the hard one, told him, decided to answer all of her questions. It turns out that there's only 300 hard ones left and about 10,000 soft ones. Since their universe and stars are dying, they were dying also. But they found a way to transfer energy from the other universe to theirs. And so long as they are able to do that, even when their stars die, they would be okay. Odin had placed a feeding station in Dua's room that brought sunlight down into the cavern so that Dua would feed. At least that's what he hoped. And in this case, while he was talking to her, she was feeding. And... After the feeding, they melded, and this meld lasted for a very long time, the longest that it ever has, and so did the unconscious period that happens during a meld. Over the next few days, Odin told Dua how it all works, the transfer of energy between universes. 
their universe transfers energy into the other universe and the other universe is transferring energy into theirs. When the energy comes into their universe, it makes the sun go cold, which doesn't matter because even if the sun goes out, as long as they're getting energy from the other side, it's all good. But when they transfer energy into the other universe, because how big their suns are, it will cause the sun to get hotter and explode. And then that's what they want because once the sun explodes on the other end and goes supernova, it will stay that way for millions of years and that will supply them with all the energy they need. They won't need anyone to help them transfer the energy. That, of course, pissed Dua off because no one seems to care that the people in the other universe are going to die. Just then, some hard ones came into the room and that's when they got Trit to admit that he took a food ball from the deep caverns and brought it up and hooked it into the feeder so that Dua could feed. And once they were fed, they were able to meld. And now he has a emotional growing in him. Dua was angry. First, she was betrayed by her triad. And second, the hard ones and the rationals were going to kill the people in the other universe. And she was determined to do something to stop them. Time passed and Twit gave birth to a baby emotional. But Dua had disappeared. They haven't seen her since the incident. Odin went looking for her and only saw her once on the surface. When he was able to speak to her for a short time, she told him that she thinks that the soft ones are all machines and that the hard ones are the only living beings and that when the soft ones pass on, they are actually killed by the hard ones. And her justification was that the hard ones who are willing to destroy an entire world of beings in another universe. So they would kill a soft one if they have to. Odin, of course, disagreed that the hard ones would kill them. But Dua left, saying she would fight the hard ones. One day, Odin's teacher, Lustin, came to see him. And he told him that Dua had been hiding in the rock and had figured out how to communicate with the beans on the other side. The hard ones think that she's trying to get the people in the other universe to shut down the positron pump. And if that happens before the sun in the other universe explodes, they will be helpless in this universe. So they want Odin to find her and get her to stop. So Odin got to it to help him look for Dua because to it being a parental, had sharper senses. Meanwhile, Dua, hiding in the rock, is half starved. She came out and managed to send across her first message. One word, F-E-E-R. She misspelled fear. The message she received was pump bad. The one she sent back was pump bad, bad, bad. She sent a final message before she passed out, asking the people on the other side for them to stop the pump. Odin and Thrit got to her just in time, just before she died. They pulled a storage battery and fed her. That's when Odin told her that the soft ones and the hard ones are the same species, that the soft ones are first children, then adults. As soft ones and then in the final meld they become a hard one they give up their individuality and become one person and the reason they were never able to meet the hard one called as is because they are as so they melded one last time and became as part three is called contend in vain this time the action moves back to our universe and takes place on the moon this part begins when solani lindstrom who acts as a tour guide meets a man from earth this man wants to see the photon synchrotron and she tells him that it belongs to the earth government 
and tourists are not allowed. Later, Selene goes to her quarters and meets with her partner, Baron Neville. And since he had asked her to tell him anytime anyone asks about the photon synchrotron, she tells him about the tourists. And he wants her to find out who the tourist is and get to know him to find out why he wants to see the photon synchrotron. Happening at the same time, the commissioner of the moon was changing. That is the top government official on the moon. And the old one was retiring and moving back to Earth, and the new one was taken over. Gottstein is the name of the new commissioner. And as he was coming up to the moon, he saw a man on the same ship as him that he recognized but can't remember his name. He just knows that he's a scientist. So Selene goes and gets the Earthman and gives him a private tour around the moon. We learn that people who was born on the moon cannot go back to Earth because their bones are smaller and their muscles couldn't handle the gravity. And while they're watching a game called Millie, the commissioner sends someone to get the Earthman. The new commissioner figured out that the man was Benjamin Allen Dennison. And he remembers him because he was one of two people who had concerns about the electronic pump. You see, a year ago, before he got the job as commissioner, he remembers he was working for Senator Burt. And Peter Lamont came to the senator with concerns about the electronic pump and that it might cause the sun to explode. So he remembers that Dennison was the first person sometime before to come with that concern. He knows that Dennison plans to stay on the moon, so he believes that Dennison is here to do some scientific investigation to find out if the electronic pump is really dangerous. And in return for ensuring that Dennison's work is published, he would like Dennison to keep him abreast on the scientific progress that's going on among the natives of the moon. Because communications between Earth and the citizens of the moon is not at its best. The next morning, Baron Neville comes to see Ben and he makes an offer that they would allow Benjamin to have the use of laboratories that are under the control of the moon citizens and that what they want to return is help with Earth and the commissioner. So Dennison using some machines that the Lunites have built. So Dennison using a machine that the Lunites have built was able to prove that Lamont was correct and that this energy will one day cause the sun to explode. But it is not enough proof to get people to abandon the electronic pump. So he needs to find something to replace all that energy. It turns out that Selene is an intuitionist, a person that has very strong intuitions that turn out to be accurate. And her friend Baron, he wants a electronic pump for the moon so that they don't have to depend on solar batteries and go out onto the surface of the moon. Between Ben and Selene, they figured out what the parallel men must be up to. And they decide that the only way to get around it is to find a new universe that fits the conditions they need so that they can get energy from it. And they also are keeping Neville up to date on what they're doing. So Dennison, with Selene's help, manages to tap into a totally different universe and leak energy from that universe into this. But the opening point is not stable. It drifts around. And just as he succeeded on that, the commissioner came and wants to talk to him. Selene, of course, tells Baron about the success, but he wants to take control of it. But since it is unstable and he doesn't want to go out on the surface 
of the moon, since he has a phobia, they need to wait until Ben can stabilize it. So Dennison is speaking to Gutstein, the commissioner, and he explains to him that they are using a young universe, one that has not yet experienced a Big Bang for this experiment. And once they succeed in stabilizing the entry point, they will be able to offset the electronic pump on Earth, which is heating up the sun. So by this universe that they're using, cooling down the sun, they can equalize everything. And while things will change in the young universe and in the parallel universe, in our universe, it will remain the same. And the commissioner brings up the point that Selene may be working behind Dennison's back because when he was coming in for a landing, he noticed that Selene was at the machinery doing something while Dennison's back was turned. Dennison was able to stabilize the leak point and the commissioner was able to get that information to Earth where Dennison became a hero along with Peter Lamont because Dennison gave Peter Lamont credit because it was based on his mathematical theories that he was able to create the cosmic leak point. When the commissioner got back from Earth, he came with news that they were going to build three cosmic pump stations on the moon since they need to be separated from the electronic pump that's on Earth by a certain distance. Of course, Neville had his own plans. He wanted to use the cosmic pump stations to move the moon away from Earth. But unbeknownst to him, the residents of the moon had learned of his plans and had voted it down in favor of building ships that would have their own cosmic pumps and be sent off around the galaxy. Since the starships will take 20 years to build, it means that Dennison and Selene will probably be alive to see them take off. And that's how the book ends. This is an excellent novel. It is one of the only ones in which Isaac Asimov actually wrote about aliens. And it is a book that won three awards, the Nebula, the Hugo, and the Locus for best novel. And I think it's worth it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. And if you did, give a thumbs up. And I will see you in the next video.